Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this Centre for Cities event in partnership with Obelio, focused on buses and the future of urban transport. This is a fair comment to say that the pandemic has had a big effect on buses and the public transport system more generally. But now, you know, following on from what the Prime Minister was talking to us about yesterday evening, as cities look to a post-pandemic future, raises important questions about what the role of buses and indeed public transport more generally is to be in that post-pandemic uh, future. And in the context of uh, an imminent forthcoming, soon to be released government national bus strategy, I think now is the ideal time to deb debate in what we want from our buses and our bus service and our bus systems uh, as we move uh, forward. We've got a fantastic panel to explore these issues, which I'll introduce um, very shortly. But as always, before we begin, um, the event is being recorded and will be made available on our website after the event. During the event, please keep your microphones on uh, mute. If you want to tweet about the event, the hashtag is CFC buses. Uh, there will be an opportunity to put questions as always to our panel after they've made their opening remarks. You can submit questions at any time. You don't have to wait until they finished. And you do that by sending a question via the chat function to ask a question. And so when we get to our questions, we like you to ask your question, so be prepared. But if you'd prefer me to read it out, then just let us know when you post your question and we'll be done by uh, by two o'clock. So that's uh, the, um, the, uh, the basic instructions. Let's get underway. Let me introduce my, uh, my panel. Our first panelist is Jonathan Bray. Jonathan is the director of the Urban Transport Group. Our second, second panelist is Alan Pilbeam, who's the Chief Operating Officer at Abellio. After Jonathan and Alan, uh, we're going to zoom into some of the issues in relation to the bus and transport issues in Greater Manchester. So our third panelist is Pascal Robinson, who is a campaigner at Better Buses Greater Manchester. Pascal will be followed by Clive Mehmet, the Chief Executive of the Greater Manchester Chamber of Commerce. And our final panelist is Sir Richard Lees, who is the leader of Manchester City Council. Each of them will uh, spend a few moments giving their opening uh, remarks and then we'll uh, get into those questions and discussions. So without further ado, Jonathan, over to you. Uh, thank you uh, and thank you uh, for the invitation to take part in this event. So in my view, bus deregulation has been one of the biggest urban policy failures since the war, uh, following on from the wiping out of tram systems in big cities in the 50s, the bus was public transport in most urban areas and bus deregulation took what were very extensive, uh, affordable, integrated and often innovative direct provision of bus services and replaced it with a mishmash of competing brands, which eventually coalesced into a de facto cartel, which has been profitably managing decline over the years. And for most of that time, very profitably managing decline. Indeed, it's the profits from bus services outside London, which were used for decades by the big groups to cross subsidise their wider expansion into other modes. And it's instructive too to look at parts of the UK where the baleful influence of bus deregulation hasn't been felt. So in London, where without the regulated system, Ken Livingstone would have been, it would have been impossible for him to do what he did in terms of introducing road user charging and rapidly expanding the bus network. And by doing so, showing uh, a leader in terms of what was going to happen next in terms of the transformation that's happened uh, to public transport more widely in London and where passengers experience what passengers elsewhere in Manchester other cities uh, want to experience one ticket, one network, one body in charge. Or Northern Ireland, uh, where uh, Northern Ireland is the only one of the four nations of the UK where bus deregulation didn't happen. It's also the only one of the four nations of the UK prior to the pandemic where bus patronage was growing. It's declining in England, Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland, where buses are provided by a state corporation, it's growing or was growing prior to the pandemic. Or Jersey, which in many ways is equivalent to a small English county, high car ownership, the kind of place in England where bus services will be minimal or non-existent, but where in Jersey under a bus franchise, the bus service is so good that as a visitor, you genuinely do not need a car to get around. So if it wasn't time for change on the buses in England before the pandemic, it certainly is now. 
Before the pandemic, considerable public subsidy was going into bus services, which were losing passengers, losing services, and where fares were all too often at near minicab prices. During the pandemic, the bus network has been utterly dependent on public money. Transport and operators have worked together to keep the show on the road, and the government has provided emergency funding necessary as well. But it's not been the best public transport network we could have been providing during the pandemic, just as it wasn't before. Nor has it been done in the most cost effective way, just as it wasn't before. And that's partly because government has maintained a strict divide in the way it funds, governs uh, and oversees heavy rail, tram and bus, limiting the ability to coordinate services. So, so I congratulate Greater Manchester on having the resolution and the ambition that the city region has displayed so often in the past on taking their proposal on bus franchising this far, despite the many obstacles and difficulties that vested interests and a challenging piece of legislation presents. As the Urban Transport Group, we bring together Greater Manchester with other city region transport authorities, and we're making the case to government for a new deal for urban transport, um, Three parts to that, devolved, simplified and guaranteed revenue funding for public transport, which will fill the gap uh, in revenue that has been created by COVID-19 to provide a level of service during the pandemic and afterwards, which will support a green and just recovery. Simplification and streamlining of the 2017 uh, bus legislation so that transport authorities can move far more easily to either franchising, direct provision or better regulated working arrangements with existing operators as they see fit. And finally, longer term capital investment deals on local transport spend, which mirrors the deals that National Rail and National Roads already enjoy. So it's time to move on from the failure of bus deregulation. It's time that the bus got the funding support it deserves from national government, a much bigger share of the DFT's overall spend, so that the bus can play its full part in a green and just recovery from the pandemic. Brilliant, thank you very much indeed, John. The great scene set in reminding us that I think you know there's a lot of public money that goes into the bus system already. I don't think everybody really appreciates that, particularly the outside of uh of of london and i think that's an important point to um uh to, to remember when we when we then talk about what we want from it alan let's turn to you obviously you're the chief operating officer at, at bellio uh, you run buses you uh, just give us your thoughts on you know future public transport economic recovery and then buses in particular uh thank you um i actually uh, want to kick off by saying now we have an opportunity um out of a crisis often comes an opportunity. And I do think stars are aligning here. We have to have a plan to move forward uh, with a new model as we ease out of lockdown. The country uh, that we live in is gonna have to pay for the mess that the pandemic has caused for our economy. We need to build back better. I will borrow that phrase from Andy Burnham. We need to turbocharge our economy and, uh, and come up with an economy that was twice as good as we originally planned. If you're gonna have a great economy, uh, certainly with the geography of the UK and uh, our population, you have to have great industrial strategies and they need to be underpinned by world-class spatially efficient multimodal transport networks to attract businesses, to attract jobs and to improve the tax take. I, have to commend the uh, government for its speed of action last year and uh, the short-term funding solution. Um, so they should be commended for that. But we now need a sustainable way forward to allow uh, us to have competition and to provide certainty. And we don't currently have either of those. The levelling up agenda, again, has to be taken seriously and has to be dealt with if we're gonna maximise the output of our economy. Uh, I believe it's an embarrassment to us all. It's an embarrassment politically. Uh, it's myopic and unhealthy for our economy. Pre-COVID, the deregulated market was failing. It was a failing commercial model, uh, not helped by the gradual reduction of networks through cuts of services. They accelerated that. And it was no longer a viable mode of choice for uh, people living in our regions. We know the prime minister is pro-bus. Uh, so I see this as an opportunity. He's also showed that in his pre-COVID uh, spending commitments. 
we know the younger generation are far more conscious of their impact on the planet, um, their, uh, the emissions impact, their moral responsibility uh, for that, uh, certainly more so than my generation. I think if we can give them uh, that world-class, spatially efficient transport solution, underpinning a great industrial strategy that I see in Manchester's plans, they will use it, they want to use it. I think they're a far, far more responsible generation coming through. So I believe we must build back better, uh, take a Keynesian approach, invest in the economy. Um, it requires funding for that. We've been pushing the government, uh, specifically the DFT, uh, to have that funding now directed as we move forward to the local transport authorities on a path uh, that should be towards franchising and control uh, to put competition back into the market and innovation which the current model lacks. And it will help us to accelerate plans around low emission vehicles and reduce the environmental impact, and reduce the load on our NHS services uh, for respiratory complaints. Manchester needs to match the ambition of number 10 and number 10 needs to match uh, Manchester's ambition and the DFT have a key role to play within all of this. We think Manchester's plan should be accelerated so that we really can turbocharge the economy and they can accelerate those transport ambitions. The deregulated model was failing. It's madness to hope that that's going to suddenly start working post-COVID. Franchising should now be implemented and it will deliver control and decision-making to the local transport authorities. They will be able to have an integrated, joined-up approach to turbocharge the economy in the regions. It will give the public what they need, a world-class public transport solution that enables firms to come, jobs to come. It will also enable those more difficult decisions in the future, workplace parking levies, bus user uh, priority, road user pricing, all of the disbenefits that all of the benefits that agglomeration will bring, you can plan for it. So we believe there is an opportunity now and we just need to seize that. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much indeed, um, Alan. So both Jonathan and Alan in their opening remarks referred to um, Greater Manchester and it being at the forefront of uh, of taking the, the, the bus strategy and the bus ideas forward. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail with our next three panelists. So first off, Pascal, give us the, the sort of passenger user perspective. Brilliant. Thanks so much for having me today. So um, I just wanted to go through the broad reasons why we're campaigning for public control here. Of course, uh, buses make up the majority of public transport journeys here. Most people will know that. They're the backbone of our region, but they're currently not up to scratch at all. Fares across the UK have gone up on average 55% in the last 10 years, and we know that wages have certainly not gone up that much. And 8 million miles of routes have been lost from Greater Manchester's network since 2010. So we're campaigning for public control because we believe it will transform networks here, but that we simply can't get the, the thriving region that we want without that. So, of course, lots of people ask um, as passengers, as, as we're campaigning, why aren't transport authorities doing their job? Why aren't they setting up this infrastructure? And the simple answer to them, of course, is that the system doesn't let authorities do that currently. Most bus networks are deregulated. And when I'm explaining to people what that means, it's that uh, we have no say over fares and routes. And even though 40 percent of bus companies revenue is public money, we, we have little control over that. So £89 million was given to bus companies uh, in Greater Manchester in 2018. And that was, of course, before the pandemic. And, and what that means is a cherry picking where bus companies are pocketing millions and, and, that, and it's us to subsidise socially necessary routes at a price that they're often setting. Um, and of course, we've seen even more public money go to bus companies over the last year. And we would really uh, echo urban transport groups proposals to streamline uh, and make legal the possibility of bringing bus companies um, into public hands as well, because we need to discuss how we're going to how we're going to run bus buses in a in a way that uses public money efficiently. 
Um, we have a huge job to get people out of cars and we need to talk about how we're going to use money best to that goal. So, of course, people know that re-regulation um, allows local authorities to plan the network. It means that you can specify the routes, the fares, the ticketing and the timetable and you can integrate. It means that you can use profits from busy routes to subsidize socially necessary routes so all communities can have a service. And it means that you can, um, as I say, integrate and have real time information because you have one body that overall has responsibility for planning a coherent network. This means that you can get a simple smart card ticket that you can use on any passenger mode um, and the current deregulated system makes this impossible because uh, this contravenes competition on bus companies have to offer their additional uh, tickets. Whereas in London, public controls integration allows for great innovation, like the hopper fare, which means that you can get two buses covering a huge part of London for 150. And that's incredibly useful to lots of people I know uh, who ha don't have very well paid jobs but need to travel long distances. We know that bus uh, use in London has doubled since deregulation, where it's fallen in Greater Manchester by 40%. And just to give you a few stats about what that means for passengers, 37% of job seekers say that transport's a barrier to accessing work. 10% of hospital outpatient appointments are missed due to transport problems. But I can also tell you about Maria, who has to walk at 4 a.m. to get to her cleaning shift. In Salf, um, sorry, in Trafford. I can also tell you about Sheila who called me once because her service has been cut so she now has to ask her neighbour to take her shopping uh, once every few weeks. We need a really good bus network for our region to thrive um, and so I want us to be talking about public control all across the UK as well as in Greater Manchester. It has the ability to save 340 million pounds across the UK. And as Jonathan mentioned in Jersey, they've managed to increase bus user, uh, bus patronage by 32% while, state, while saving the state 800,000 pounds a year in subsidy. And there's huge support for this. In Greater Manchester, 76% of people want to see their buses in public control. And all four of the major political parties in England support our calls. Um, and that's because we're sick and tired of an expensive and, and often unreliable um, network here in Greater Manchester, ever in decline. And um, we believe that partnerships is not the way to go at all. It allows bus companies to be continually um, have all the control and in the partnership offer in Greater Manchester they say that they will not run services unless they are well they will only run services if they are commercially vi viable and that still means that bus companies are able to make a choice about what is enough profit for them and so I'm really excited to hear from everyone on this call I think this is a, a brilliant discussion that we're having and I, my hope is that we can get services that work for communities uh, over the next year and we have a real opportunity to do that. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Pascal. 76% of the public and GM in favour of uh, the bus have been under public control. I wonder how many of them uh, know what the current system is, which is always interesting in the sense, right? It's like, do you know what you're getting and who's responsible for it? Uh, often they don't, and it's quite revealing when they're told, not only on this issue, but on uh, others as well. So that was the passenger perspective from Great Manchester. Let's turn to the business perspective. Clive, um, give us your view on the importance of buses and what we need to do about it. Thanks, Andrew. Hello, everybody. And that, that's a fair observation, Andrew. I mean, <clears throat> back in November 19, um, Centre for Cities launched Simon Jeffries. I always give Simon a name check. Excellent report on the on bus franchising in Manchester. And uh, the report naturally talks about the importance of modern, environmentally sustainable, fully accessible, more importantly, fully integrated with the local transport network buses, on which everyone is happy to travel regardless of background or mobility level, those sort of things that Pascal was just referring to. Made the point that buses are critical urban infrastructure. They're not the less glamorous or relative of tram, train, cycling, walking. I mean, that's why three quarters of people in Greater Manchester and most other places use bus. I think we're down to about 60% of the pre-COVID levels at the moment. When that report was uh, launched, we were just about to launch our public consultation in, in Manchester into where the, the, basically the question was, will a London style approach provide more routes, centralized, harmonized timetables, tickets and standard, and standards, sorry, and ensure that where you live, 
doesn't determine your access to bus services. Well, basically, we had about 80% of that response of eight, those 8,500 people was very positive to the franchising scheme. When you launched that report, Andrew, I was openly open-minded agnostic about whether a, you know, whether a partnership agreement enhanced or not could deliver the same outcomes. And I don't see franchising as a holy grail, but I increasingly understood that it, to produce an integrated system, you can't do that on a voluntary basis. And it has to be part of a statutory system and operating within a statutory framework. And, and your report was unequivocal in setting out the benefits that Better Busters brings to cities. It does affect productivity. You know, the old story about productivity in the North being inferior to the South. Well, in a big part of that is, you know, the efficiency, efficiency of your infrastructure, about more equitable growth, health, social cohesion, air pollution, and all those things. And as, as all the previous speakers have said, deregulation has not been a great success. So why shouldn't other cities emulate what's been available to the capital city of this country for many years? Now, in June last year, when the Greater Manchester Command Authority and Richard will talk about this, received the results of that consultation, quite rightly, they said, well, we've just got to now think about what the ramifications, implement, uh, implications of COVID has on, on, the, on that proposal at the time and produced a big, I think about 150 page report. And again, it was interesting, Transport for Greater Manchester set out four scenarios, looking at it through the, the context of fare box impact over four years. And I think that ranged from around plus 30 million to minus nearly 300 million because of this real uncertainty about how people will travel in the future based on behavioral change as a result of the pandemic. Transport Focus, which I have great time for because they use a huge sample of around 60,000 people across the country. Now, while they tell us that around 80% of people that use the bus feel fairly safe and comfortable, what's important of those not using the bus, a third of those not using the bus say, you know, are, are not because they don't feel safe. And 20% of those non-users are actively avoiding public transport at the moment. But under all those scenarios, that impact report states that franchising is still the best option for a fully integrated system. And again, importantly, the funding is still available. I'm sure Richard can confirm that uh, to pay for that transition. So whether you're franchised or not, COVID means that incredibly difficult choices will have to be made to manage the new financial risks. I mean, local authorities will still need to fund gaps in the commercial market, but franchising does produce, you know, provide this huge strategic benefit of coordination and then potential integration. So despite the additional risks, the net benefits will be higher. And again, the value for money in the end will be better. And the results that came from that further, the, the results that came from that further co uh, consultation are currently being analysed. Um, so should we wait and see to assess the impact of the pandemic? Well, COVID may have magnified the changes that already existed, but the same challenges remain and must still be addressed. And, you know, bus use was falling, as you've heard, and the public sector was significantly subsidising some services and concessionary fares. And, you know, during the pandemic, our bus operators received emergency funding directly from government. And that meant that local transport authorities were unable to direct and adequately influence how it was allocated despite still having to pay operators for the concessionary travel at the pre-pandemic at the pre-pandemic levels. So basically, I mean, for me, I, I think that this still remains something that we absolutely must set, set about doing. You know, the impact of the pandemic, and there's never been a better time when to make better use of increasing these scarce resources over the foreseeable future, you've got to integrate and coordinate your services. There is no reason whatsoever for not proceeding ambitiously and accelerating that table at the moment to produce the services that we need to protect actually the most vulnerable people that are victims of, of the impact of this pandemic. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Clive. So uh, let's get our final and third perspective from, uh, from Great Man. So obviously, Sir Richard, uh, you know, you pursued and were pu pushing forward on uh, franchising before the pandemic. So Richard, I mean, just where just where are you now and have you have you changed your mind about anything? Well, I, th I think I will start, Andrew, by uh, by going back before the uh, uh, pan pandemic and go back to uh, something that comes from an agreement reached with government in 2014, so uh, seven years ago. 
uh, which is when the devolution agreement was struck with the then Chancellor of the uh, Exchequer. And I have to say for that devolution agreement, uh, bus reform was the single most important element uh, uh, of it. Indeed, uh, for our uh, current mayor of Greater Manchester, I often remind him that uh, bus reform is the only reason he's there. And there is actually quite a lot of uh, truth, uh, uh, truth to that. And um, uh, there's a very simple reason for uh, giving it that level of uh, importance, which was a recognition, and I'm going to repeat what's been said at least three times from speakers now, the recognition of the need for an integrated transport system, one where, like London, you can cap fares, one where, like London, you can have a single ticket or smart ticketing for any public transport journey within your, uh, within, within your area. And since 2014, I'd say that the arguments for that have grown rather than, uh, rather than diminished. And I think certainly things that, uh, uh, again, other speakers have touched on, uh, you'll find particularly uh, younger populations now are less likely to own cars. They don't see the reason uh, for it, but they still want to be able to move, move around. Uh, not just the, the zero carbon climate change argument, but also the clean air argument has really come to the fore over the, uh, over the last uh, uh, f few years. All of that, I think, accelerates the need for uh, that integrated transport system. Clearly, though, you, we can't ignore the COVID context, not least because COVID is not going to be a passing fad. It's going to be with us for quite some time, uh, one way or another and we have to operate within that context. But again, I think COVID has emphasized the need for that integrated transport system. And of course, the case for buses being part of that integrated tra uh, transport system. Uh, it's interesting the impact that COVID has had on public transport, clearly because people are staying at home, working from home, uh, then there has been an enormous diminution of use of public transport. If I take Manchester City Council as an example, over 51% of our uh, staff are still working on site wherever that happens to be, because that's the only place that they can do that work. I can tell you for the uh, health service that we are uh, busy trying to uh, uh, save, all of them have to work at their normal place of work. It doesn't work uh, otherwise. And for an enormous number of the, uh, those people to get to work, no buses, they can't get to work, uh, as, as simple as that. And uh, although there was, I think, uh, at its peak, bus usage went down to about 27% of normal, it is the sector that ha of public transport that has recovered most over uh, that period of time. And there are a number of reasons for that, but not least it is, of course, uh, it is used by young people to get to school, college, uh, university. It is used by people on low incomes in particular to be able to get to uh, work. It is an essential ingredient of the basics of our, uh, our economy. Um, so the arguments have strengthened, uh, un undoubtedly, um, but... Uh, the other fact that's come in, I think, that strengthened the case for change again is that level of public subsidy. Uh, our bus services have always depended on public subsidy. That has grown greater as a result of COVID, and that's going to continue for several years uh, to come. And it is absurd that you have a system that is largely now paid for by the public sector, but the public sector exercises no control over, uh, uh, over it. And if we're going to talk about notions of partnership, that's a very one-sided partnership uh, in, 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 indeed. Bus companies decide to do what they feel like it, the public sector pays. And that's been happening through, cons uh, through COVID as well. Uh, the lo uh, local transport authorities have been continuing to pay for concessionary services that are no longer being used because it's based on pre-COVID uh, levels. So where, where are we going uh, on, the, on, on this? And uh, as Clive said, it was absolutely right that we uh, re-ran the public consultation, that we re-ran the numbers to take account of the COVID uh, crisis. Actually, in the, the first round of consultation, we don't know the figures for the second round. Uh, I have to slightly disagree with Pascal, because in our first public consultation, it's 83% of the public supported the proposals, actually. It's even higher than, 
high than that with a very high business support as well. And although I think uh, Alan will be the first to acknowledge that uh, bus operators were not unified in their approach uh, uh, to this, and that remains the, uh, remains the uh, case now. We will see, we're evaluating the results of the consultation, second consultation now. We don't know what those are uh, yet, but I would be very, very surprised, particularly from the public, if we did not get a similarly high figures uh, about what the public think, uh, think about this. Um, so there is a decision to be made. I think government can help us with that decision. The national bus strategy ought to be actively supporting integration. It ought to be making sure that uh, parts of public transport like heavy rail that are outside the networks at the moment become part of that integration. It should allow us to, uh, Greater Manchester to be able to better integrate with our neighboring areas uh, as, as well. And I think uh, they also ought to be providing some, some funding as well. And uh, to answer a point that Clive made, yes, we still have the funding for the transitional fund, uh, costs that will be required for a franchise system. But really, it'd be a lot better if government was to start meeting those costs. So instead, we could use that local resource to be investing in an improved, uh, an improved system. And that's, I think, what we'd rather be doing. Uh, the final thing to be said is that uh, it uh, goes back to uh, close to where I started on this. This is a mayoral decision. Uh, we are expecting that mayor to make uh, that decision probably in the next couple of months. I certainly hope in the next couple of months because it's taken us a long time to get to this, uh, this point. Uh, in my view, it is the most important decision that Andy Burnham will make. And that goes back to his time in government as well. Uh, I'm just going to hope he makes the right decision in a few very weeks good time. thank you very much sir richard so will he, do you think you'll make the decision before the next election or uh, or after if i was him i'd make I, I, now i'm not him if i was him i would make it before yes if i was him i would make it before as well but but you're but you're right that we are neither of us are him so we we'll wait and see what he uh, what he says uh, so we've had quite a few um questions thank you very much for my panelists a sort of a degree of consensus reform is vital and necessary a sort of broad consensus on more control uh, a kind of consensus towards franchising as the option and let me you know as Clive already said let me declare that you know the center of cities is in favor of franchising particularly in our big urban areas or we recognize that other places work in slightly differently but let there's a, a good question from Paul Walker Paul if you're on the call um, I think you you want to sort of challenge that it doesn't have to be franchised. So I'd like you just to make your pitch and then I'll get colleagues to come back and tell you why they think you're right or whether they think you're wrong. Paul, are you still on the call? I am, yes, thank Good. you. Um, Fire away. Thanks, I've got a horrible feeling they won't agree with what <laughs> my question right. is. Um, I, I, I get the feeling that we're in quite an ideolog ideologicalized um, debate here, but... Um, I suppose in terms of there's been quite a few comments made really um, with quite wide ranging um, statements about overall decline in bus use. Now this might be in the case in areas with cumbersome former PTEs where little is done to improve bus journey times and bus priority. However, where, where positive voluntary partnerships are in place, such as Bournemouth and Poole and Southampton, for example, these have delivered the highest bus ridership outside of London. Meanwhile, as a result of austerity, we've seen services cut in rural county areas because bus service provision is not a statutory service. Why do the panel then think that franchising is a one site suits all approach to England when the clearly positive voluntary partnerships have been successful elsewhere? Really? OK, so um, let's get the let's get a kind of national view first off. Jonathan, you 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 give a response to, you know, to that request. And I get Alan to say something about, you know, because you run them and you run them in different contexts to say something about that. And then I'll get my uh, my GM colleagues to, to to go to where where they think why they think franchising is the best option. Jonathan. Uh, a few points. I think the first thing is it should be down to local determination, how such a local service as buses is provided. Uh, it's, a, it's a hyper local issue buses uh, and it should be down to uh, locally democratically uh, elected authorities to decide what they think is the best course for them. I think uh, you can get better bus services through uh, collaboration with existing incumbents. 
Um, it can be easier when in parts of the south uh, where uh, you're starting from a low base in terms of bus ridership uh, and still well below the levels you're getting in many city regions. Uh, my concern is more that the north or some of our big cities fall down to the level of where some of the places in the south are, where the bus is really down to being a kind of niche um, a safety net, social safety net, has a few niche roles around park and ride uh, and for appearing in uh, industry uh, publicity material. Um, I also uh, think the advantage of franchising is unlike uh, trying to come to agreement with an incumbent operators, uh, which may or may not deliver results. Uh, a franchise can determine outcomes. So you, have, you take the money that's going in and you contractualize the outcome. So you should be able to guarantee the results in a way that you can't do with partnership. I think the other thing is there are limits to what even the most uh, effective uh, agreement between authorities and incumbent monopolies can achieve. Uh, Pascal set out some of those around ticketing because I think what passengers in big city regions want is a service as a whole for public transport across bus, light rail and heavy rail that acts together as one system rather than a, a collection of the good, the bad and the ugly uh, and oh there's a great service here but you know we'll, we'll focus on that, forget about the rest. It's not about that, it's providing as a network as a whole and also of course as I was saying earlier when you look at the UK as a whole, you look at London, you look at Northern Ireland, you look at Jersey, it's interesting to see how the places that don't have deregulation are doing well compared with England that does have deregulation and isn't. Okay, very good. Uh, Alan, why you, you know, you're in favour of franchising, you run buses in a franchise system. Uh, tell us why, and I presume there's no ideology associated uh, with your view. It's simply operational good sense. Yeah, so first of all, uh, I've worked on both sides of the fence. Prior to Rebellio, I worked for a, uh, one of the big uh, five and uh, worked in a deregulated market. So I've seen both sides of the equation. Prior to that, I was in logistics and I underst understood from logistics how um, competition was meant to work. And, uh, and I really don't see it in the deregulated market. And there are, of course, downsides if you don't have proper competition. Um, the market was failing up to, there, uh, up, up to COVID. Yes, there were some uh, small islands of success. Uh, I'll, I'll accept that. But overall, it, it was failing. It wasn't playing its part uh, within those world and, and, and uh, underpinning world-class, uh, spatially efficient transport solutions, as, as I indicated earlier. Um, there's been years of opportunity for partnerships uh, to move forward, but they haven't. So what's going to change after COVID? I really I just don't buy it. Um, so therefore, uh, even if you didn't have COVID, surely there comes a point when you've got to try something different. So you go down the franchising route, you give control, you give the funding uh, locally, uh, the, the transport authorities, but also the public can decide uh, actually where they do want those services. You can cross subsidise um, uh, uh, to enable you to team and ladle. Uh, to provide those socially inclusive services, but also have a controlled and integrated transport solution, walking, cycling, bus, tram, rail. Uh, makes a lot of sense to me. And I, I also think you're far more likely to get the politicians to take those harder decisions that I referred to earlier around workplace parking levy, uh, uh, bus priority, road user parking, as we need it, when you do get uh, some disbenefits uh, from, the, uh, from the growth that we will have. At some point, you're gonna have autonomous vehicles as well coming into play. I just can't imagine a free for all within town of big pods, small pods, long pods, medium sized pods, without actually having coordination and control. I think it's the inevitable path uh, that we need to be on. Uh, so I've seen both sides of the argument. I can see the small islands of success, but overall it was failing. Hello? Frozen. Do we have anyone that can step in in place of Andrew? Uh, looks like you might yes, I can take over. So I'm Paul Sweeney, I'm Director of Policy and Research. Looks like Andrew's internet has 
foot has fallen over. Um, great. I can't remember where exactly Andrew was next in terms of uh, in terms of questions. Anybody else who wanted to uh, to take this question on? Can I make a, a quick comment, uh, if, 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 if if I can, uh, perhaps respond to the, uh, uh, the the ideological point of view and. Uh, uh, I, I don't. Th this might be unfair, Paul, but I've just Googled Paul Walker buses, and I get go ahead. Uh, so I suspect you might have a, an interest within this uh, uh, as well, from a, an operator's, a particular operator's uh, point of view. Although I say misguided point of view, and as an elected politician, I clearly have no uh, uh, commercial interest. My interest is uh, what I can do to support the economy of Greater Manchester, and what I can do to get people in Greater Manchester to benefit from. Uh, an effective economy and that means them being able to move around so that's the the interest uh, i have we have a contrast in greater manchester we've got a tram system uh, it operates under a franchise it operates very effectively uh, under a, 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 fr a franchise but it means for uh, a, a capped daily fare i can move anywhere on that transport uh, network and I can move quickly and efficiently. Of course, it's a, a fixed network, so it's limited to where it goes. To be fully effective, it needs to go with other parts of the public transport system, particularly the workhorse of the public transport system, which is our bus, uh, bus network. But the fact that we've got that in Greater Manchester demonstrates to all of our population what we really could have if we had a, a joined up, integrated, managed uh, network for, uh, for public transport. And it's not about being anti-operator. I have to say that all of our operators over the COVID crisis have worked really, really closely uh, with Transport for Greater Manchester, with, uh, with, with the mayor, to make sure we can do what, uh, do what we can. Uh, I actually think that this will be a win for the operators as well in the franchised uh, uh, system. And um, actually by working with us, it's even more likely to be a win. So yes, let's have a partnership, but let's have a partnership within a franchise system, not in a free for all system. Okay, very good. Can am I am I back on? People can hear me. Sorry about that. Uh, wonders of working from home and doing it all uh, digitally. Uh, never mind. Um, let let's a couple of questions on from Nick Father. Nick, are you still on the call? Because um, you asked the question about you know the worry. Your worry was about whether the local authority or the and then has to pick up all the the risk on the on the fair side. So just ask your question and we'll get into that. No, Thank you, everyone. And a, a, a fantastic uh, conversation going on. Um, I'm down in the south of England and um, we've got a lot of issues with politicians down here, um, just my view, and who's, one, who's going to pay for all the buses, local authority f funding is very, very tight, and who, who actually thinks it's a good idea to use the bus in my part of the world, in, in southern Hampshire, we've got the local elections coming up, and both sides are already fighting over who should give the road space? Should there be more buses? Should there be more cycling? Or should we all just go back to the motor car? Um, so the London network, I understand, is quite expensive to run. Yeah. Again, who's going to pay for it? Yeah. And I chair of a community rail partnership down this part of the world. We were very close to with the bus operators, the ferry operators, and obviously the train operators. We work on com com um, integrated ticketing ideas and we find that if the benefit flows both ways people will talk and they'll introduce things yeah and i think if you still still keep saying the same old same old you'll get the same old okay same. Thank you. excellent okay pascal what's your view on uh you know how we assure the public that they don't have to you know or the local authorities don't have to pick up all the the risk yeah i think this is a really brilliant question thanks for passing it to me um the simple answer is that, that we're already paying for our, for this network. Uh, we are the ones uh, funding it, so we should be able to at least have control over it. Funding for bus comes from taxpayer money, public money, or it comes from our fares. And if we believe as a society that we need to have a really good bus network that gets people out of cars, we should therefore be willing to uh, invest money into that and make sure that it's going to the right places as well. Um, that was true before the pandemic, and it's even more true now as we are giving bus companies a huge proportion of their income. I would, um, I would, I would challenge the idea that the London network is an expensive network to run. It's a, it's one of the biggest, best bus networks in the world, um, it, certainly in the country, and that requires funding. Um, we are 
the government has of course cut funding for London's uh, public transport and now we are on set, if not already, the, one of the only capitals in Europe not to subsidize transport. Other capitals across Europe fund it because they know it's incredibly important to keeping your economy going. People need to be able to get around. So I, I think that if anything, we should be talking about massive investment across the country to match that uh, so that we can get great transport networks anywhere. And, and just uh, on that, the question that that we had before, I think it's important if we're talking about what works, we should talk about the fact that the second and third uh, highest uh, number of bus journeys per, per head is Reading and Nottingham, where they have public ownership. And of course, we should look at Manchester's investigation into public control, which is certainly not ideological and has been independently audited across many different scenarios to show that public control is a better use of public money. Yeah, very good. Clive, I mean, Sir Richard said in a sense, you know, bus reform is, you know, is the number one issue for for him and, you know, for on the public side. I mean, on, on the on the business community side as well, has, has that been part of the story for Greater Manchester? Yeah, I mean, what's important to the business community is the efficiency of the transportation system, and a huge part of that is is the, its integration. Uh, let me go to Nick's observation about the cost of the London system. Well, um, let's look at what facilitated the growth, the economic growth of London in recent years: Victoria Line, Jubilee Line, Dotland Light Railway, Thameslink, Crossrail to come, and an excellent bus system as well. And that's given that that was the absolutely fundamental driver of its huge economic growth. And that's what we require in Manchester. And, you know, going back to Paul's earlier question, it's not ideological. It's about what, what's the best system for a place. And a big part of place is the scale of the place. And also in the current circumstances. And I say what's accelerated, you know, the, the sheer impact of what COVID brings actually makes the case for franchising absolutely more persuasive because you've got to make best use of your resources. And if you've got tight public finances for the foreseeable future, you've got to damn well make sure you make the best use of those resources. So that's the, they're the critical things for me, Andrew. Okay, brilliant. So we've had several questions in, um, and I want to turn to just to get some views from the panel on, obviously we've got the national bus strategy, you know, it's forthcoming, we're told soonish, uh, not exactly uh, ideally when, but we, but soonish. We've all said it's really important. I mean, A, how confident are we that government really gets what needs to be done um, and, you know, is gonna act uh, on that. So Alan, let me come to you first. Give me, give me your view on, confidence that government understands what needs to be done and is going to act on it? Um, I think the government actually needs to act with more pace. The DFT needs to act with more pace. I am concerned that they aren't necessarily hearing both sides, uh, uh, both sides of the argument when it comes to talking to the bus industry. We haven't been part of the consultation. If, you, if you're talking to existing trade body, they tend to represent um, the status quo. Um, uh, uh, but I also want a different approach uh, from government, and uh, and we've been urging that uh, to actually go and talk first of all to the uh, to the city regions, and actually try and come to a, a more agile uh, approach to doing business, uh, rather than almost an approach whereby you go and bid you, you go and bid for uh, funding. I would I would rather that we actually take a grown up approach uh, to this that is agile, and uh, we're both. Uh, sides uh, come come to the table and actually uh, there's uh, give and take people are more ambitious locally with their plans they want to accelerate those plans but simply the government come up with the funding we've been doing everything we can uh, to push for this more what I would view as a, a more grown-up approach uh, to doing business um, because we have to pay as I said right at the beginning for this uh, for this pandemic there's a huge there's a huge bill that has to be picked up and you're only going to be doing that by actually speeding things up and uh, investing in things. And, and it, it, at the end of the day, it comes back to, as Clive, Clive just said, if you're going to have a great economy, you've got to have a great transport network. It's, it's pretty basic thinking. Yeah, very good. Jonathan, your thoughts, you know, since does, does government get it and are they going to act on, on it? 
So uh, to be uh, optimistic, I think the Prime Minister is pro-bus, is pro-active travel. We saw that in the active travel strategy and is stood behind it uh, in supporting the low traffic neighbourhoods uh, in London. He's also pro-bus and so is advisors because he's of his London background. I suspect it will be big on aspirations and it will read a bit like a manifesto if I had to guess. Um, but the crunch comes in terms of what follows on from that in terms of a detail because I don't think it's going to have all the detail there. I think three things on what it needs to do on the uh, detail. Um, uh, we need uh, to spend a greater proportion of our transport budget on bus than we do now. One of the common arguments put against uh, bus franchising is, you know, oh my gosh, it might cost us more money, we might have to spend more money on bus. Well, we should spend more money on bus uh, because the benefits you get from spending on bus uh, are far greater than what you get from spending on a lot of things we're spending on transport at the moment. Uh, uh, National Roads Programme, step forward, please. Uh, and the amount of impact you could have for the kind of money we lavish on other transport investment, um, we could uh, spend that on bus instead. So yes, we should be spending more, um, though uh, uh, just uh, in case someone says it, the caveat is that bus franchising uh, can do that more efficiently at the same time. Uh, so it's not about wasting money. I think the second thing we need to do is reform bus funding. It's a right old mess at the moment. As Richard was saying, uh, we've gone through the pandemic with the government as expecting us to pay for services that aren't being provided and for concessionary travel journeys that aren't being made because they wanted to keep the mess of the funding system that previously existed. So we need that to change, we need it to be simplified, we need it to be devolved to transport authorities so that the planning of buses can be done in a more integrated way with the modes and we can get the best outcomes. The final thing it needs to do is simplify the processes set out in the 2017 legislation so that not everybody has to go through all the pain that Greater Manchester had and to prevent some of the gaming that some of the operators have been indulging in to slow down the process. So those are three practical things, um, but there's a huge task ahead because um, we don't want to go back to where we were on bus. That's not that wasn't a good place. We're going to have to spend quite a bit more money in subsidy uh, than we have been doing to reach the aspirations that people have for more bus use, more modal shift, and for buses contributing to wider climate targets, which should hopefully come more to the fore as the pandemic dies away. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dean. Pascal, since government gets it, I mean, what's the, how do the passenger perspective, how do we make sure the government was, is responding to that? I think I'd echo a lot of what Jonathan just said. Um, we should be able to choose our the way our transport is run locally, and that means simplifying the options so that, as Jonathan said, we don't have to do a three or four year process to, to think about those options. Simplifying public control, simplifying the possibility of public ownership as well, which is currently illegal, and um, and investing more in bus because it, it's the best use of public money. Yeah. Okay. Clive, your view on it, again, from a bit, you know, the business voice making the case to government for more intervention in, in the bus, bus industry, bus services? Yeah, well, I'm afraid I have a less sanguine view that government will do what needs to be done in this respect, because I don't think that they do see bus as critical uh, infrastructure. I don't think they do. It does fit with their strange definition sometimes of brands banking new big capital spend that delivers that and i yes i i, I get to, that boris johnson may have a personal um he certainly uh, understands buses in the context of london but when you talk to officials i don't see that shared still for buses i still think there's a lot of work to be done you know circulate that report andrew get more people thinking about this is critical transport infrastructure you can't take one major component out of an integrated system and expect the rest to work and i still and i've not seen anything that i've heard yet about the national bus strategy that gives me the degree of optimism that i've heard from others yeah that's a good point um richard similar question to us was but but also a, an extra one which is you know gm has pushed forward on bus reform i would say GM has pushed further than probably the other uh, mayors and the other city regions. Is is that a problem? You know, in a sense, does that weaken the the case to government that more needs to be done? Would they will they turn around and say, well, not enough places have done what what, what they can already? I mean, your view on that as well? 
Well, I, I think to be clear, a lot of other places are probably waiting for uh, Greater Manchester to be away along this journey because it's something that uh, I think Alan talked about is that the legislative route to this is not a, a simple, straightforward uh, route. It's very lengthy, it's, it's very uh, complicated, there are lots of pitfalls uh, with, within it. And if this is, a, a, what might I say, yet another example of Greater Manchester being a pioneer, then I think I'm very happy for us to be uh, a pioneer as, as long as we actually get to the end of the journey uh, on uh, this particular uh, bit, of pi uh, bit of pioneering. I think uh, perhaps I think two other things to add to that. Uh, we, we do need to think about efficiency. I, I think a number of speakers have spoken about spending more money. Well, let's just uh, assume for a moment we're not going to spend any more money, that we're going to spend exactly the same amount of money we, we're currently spending. And this goes back to Nick's question. Uh, the assessment that was done, the first assessment that was done for uh, Greater Manchester demonstrated that that was 10%, at least 10% more efficient than any other option. So actually, this is a route that basic would give us more for our money in the first place. And you think government ought to be interested in being able to get more for its money, and particularly in, in the in the current uh, current climate. But I think the last thing, and I was probably slightly closer to uh, uh, Clive and the other speakers around uh, around government, and it is. Uh, going back to one of the arguments for devolution in the first place, and it's the uh, disconnect between different bits of government. Uh, I do think that uh, probably the Prime Minister and Number 10 and the people in Number 10 uh, get what's needed and what need needs to be done. Uh, I'm not at all convinced that the people within the Department for Transport think the same thing, and government finds it really, really difficult to join up. We find it a lot easier at a local uh, a local level, and it's why actually the devolution route for transport, like everything everything else, is far more likely to give us efficient, joined up, integrated networks that we need. Excellent, well put, and I think a great way um, to finish. It's it's very close to two o'clock. We could carry on, but unfortunately. Um, uh, we can't, I'm, I'm afraid. So uh, my thanks to my uh, my brilliant panel, Jonathan, Alan, Clive, Pascal, uh, and Sir Richard. Um, thanks to Abelio for working with us on this event and indeed our previous work on, uh, on buses and transport more generally. Thank you all for coming and participating and asking your questions. Sorry I didn't get through as many as I uh, would have liked. You will see the recording of this event and all the work that we've done on transport and economic growth on our website, centerthecities.org. Our next event is tomorrow, uh, and that's about health inequalities and its relationship with um, public services and productivity. Hopefully to, hopefully to see some of you at tomorrow's event, but um, until the next time, take care and stay safe. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye.